So we're going to talk about cellular respiration in this video. I've decided to break it up into two parts because there's a lot to say and I want to make sure that you have a chance to watch both parts very carefully. So uh, we could start with a summary formula. Um, what overall is going on in cellular respiration? This is a very different idea than a typical chemical formula because we uh, I like to get across with drawing three arrows like I have, that this is not um, just a one-step process. This is not just a one reaction arrow. Um, it is not as if sugar and oxygen themselves combine and then make CO2, water, and ATP. Um, that doesn't happen at all. Um, in fact, sugar and oxygen never even directly interact in this whole process. Um, so what this is instead is it's just a very broad summary. What goes in overall and what comes out overall? Um, and, and that's what we're just trying to depict in this overall formula. Um, so broadly, um, uh, typical books would say that sugar and oxygen come in um, and carbon dioxide, water, and ATP are produced. I like to just throw in a few extra things for your consideration. Um, it doesn't have to just be uh, uh, glucose. It can be any kind of uh, food fuel. Your body can also burn fats. Um, it would just um, uh, take a fat and sort of insert it into a different part of the respiratory factory. It would probably start the citric acid cycle directly. Um, and then the same thing could be true of certain amino acids. Your, your body can also burn those, um, although we prefer to burn fats and carbohydrates first. So we're going to assume that a cell is burning glucose, which it often is, but it just doesn't have to burn just glucose. Um, so glucose, um, it requires oxygen. Um, and I like to go ahead and throw in that ADP and phosphates come in as well because remember that the whole point of burning the sugar is that it's generating the energy needed to combine these two together to make ATP. Um, so I usually like to write that in the equation as well. So the goal of cellular respiration is to make ATP. Do not forget that in writing your formula because that's the whole purpose of cellular respiration. Um, water and carbon dioxide are also produced, but they're really just byproducts. Um, so you actually do generate some of your own water metabolically through processes like respiration. It's just that you don't generate enough to stay hydrated. You're going to have to drink some as a human at least. Um, and carbon dioxide is also a byproduct and your body wants to get rid of that um, by breathing it out. Um, so if uh, these are the general uh, summary formulas, um, you could uh, memorize these um, and then um, you could just use your chemistry skills to balance the chemical formula. Um, you'd need six carbon dioxides over here to balance the six in the one um, sugar that there is. Um, and then you could balance the hydrogens as well by making six waters. Um, and then if you were to count up all your oxygens um, on both sides, you'd find that you need six molecular oxygens. So that would be the ratio um, as well. Um, you don't have to memorize that, I don't think, if you just sort of think about balancing the equation correctly. So that's respiration. Um, how can you remember this formula? I just would encourage you to think about what you do as a human. Um, you take in food, you don't produce it. You take in oxygen, you don't produce it. Um, you breathe out carbon dioxide. You breathe out water vapor if you want to breathe into your hand. Um, so if you just kind of think about what you do, I think it's pretty easy to remember the cellular formula. Um, and of course, ATP isn't something you breathe out because that's what your cells want to keep. So you don't breathe that out. Okay, so that's the summary formula. Now let's go into the step-by-step -step process. Um, cellular respiration is not a one-step process. There's multiple parts and each one of them is, um, has multiple steps itself. So we can broadly create a flow chart first and then we'll discuss some of the early steps in this half of the video. So uh, respiration would always start with glycolysis. And in fact, glycolysis can actually start either of two processes because there's a bit of a fork in the road after glycolysis. Um, and this uh, uh, next step depends on whether oxygen is available or not. Um, if oxygen is unavailable, then um, the cell will continue on in a process called fermentation. Um, that might be a process I talk about in the second video, perhaps. 
Um, we're going to assume that oxygen is available for the purposes of this video, so respiration continues, not fermentation. Um, and respiration would continue with a process called the citric acid cycle. Um, it can also be called the Krebs cycle, just in case you see that as well, named for the scientist who first discovered it. Um, and then from the citric acid cycle, we would proceed on to steps that are sometimes um, referred to as the electron transport chain, and then a step after that called chemiosmosis. Um, sometimes um, um, these two steps can be kind of collectively referred to um, by a very fancy name, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and we'll, we'll go into that in the second video. Um, boy, spelling that's pretty long. So oxidative phosphorylation is sort of both of them considered together. So um, those are kind of the overall steps. Um, in this video, we're going to focus on glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. We're going to see that those two steps really both involve cutting up the sugar. Um, uh, the sugar is really involved in these first two steps, and we're going to see that oxygen is involved in kind of these final two steps. Um, so we're trying to cut up the sugar, and cutting up the sugar itself will generate a little bit of ATP, but not very much. So most of the energy that's generated by cutting up the sugar, actually, um, the energy is sort of harvested in a different form. Um, and it's harvested in the form of what are called high energy electrons. So you can think of an overall sugar molecule with all those polar covalent bonds. Um, each one of those bonds contains you know, two electrons sort of interacting in that bond. And the way you can sort of think of it is while we're cutting up the sugar, there are going to be various opportunities when a carrier molecule called NAD can come in and strip away the high energy electrons away from the sugar uh, for use in what we're going to see as the electron transport chain later. So um, high energy electrons are too unstable to um, uh, go around in the cell themselves. So we do need this carrier molecule. Um, it alternates between being called NAD or NAD. Technically, it's NAD plus, but I don't really care about that. Um, you can think of NAD as being um, sort of an empty shuttle. Um, it's called NAD when it doesn't have any high energy electrons. And then when it picks up high energy electrons, it becomes NADH. Um, because as it turns out, it picks up electrons and it also picks up an H plus, which doesn't really matter. Um, uh, and I'll just refer to that as NAD huh. For our purposes, you can just think of that as the carrier that is full of high energy electrons. Um, it's heading to the electron transport chain to drop them off. And when it does drop them off, it turns back into NAD. And then NAD will go back to the processes of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle and try and pick up high energy electrons once again. Um, so this is just sort of a back and forth process that's constantly occurring um, if respiration is going on. Okay. So if we have the idea of how high energy electrons work, then we're ready to go into some detail about what's happening. Uh, we'll start with glycolysis. So there is this giant figure that I found on the internet. Um, and your book also has this in two giant um, pages that are sort of set out from the rest of the chapter nine. Um, and immediately this looks overwhelming, right? I'm going to zoom into some of these steps because I do want you to see how many steps it is. Um, each one of these steps, um, you also see in red here, um, enzymes that are responsible for um, uh, catalyzing each step. You can see that they're enzymes because a lot of them end in the suffix ace, just like we've discussed before. Um, so each enzyme um, is involved in helping the sugar transform from one intermediate to the next. Um, and we see that it's, at some point in this process, the sugar is actually being um, cleaved into two separate sugars. Um, and then we have a bunch of three carbon sugars that are being cut and transformed along the way. So generally, what are we doing in glycolysis? We are lysing the glucose a little bit. We're cutting up the sugar. Um, and you do not need to memorize any of these intermediate steps or any of these enzymes. Um, I just want you to notice a few broad things. Um, we're actually spending a little bit of ATP early on. Um, so some of the early steps spend ATP, um, but some of the later steps um, produce ATP back. 
Um, and we actually produce four ATP at the end and only spend two. So for our purposes, glycolysis is um, a net and uh, a net ATP generator. Um, I also want uh, you to pay attention to this step over here. Um, when um, there's one opportunity for NAD to come in and grab high energy electrons away from the sugar and become NADH. So what are we broadly doing in glycolysis? We're just starting to cut up the sugar. Um, glucose comes in. Um, I didn't highlight it on the other slide, but um, the last sugar of glycolysis is worthy of note. We just call it pyruvate. Um, technically, it's two pyruvates since in one step we cut the sugar into two smaller sugars. So we actually get two pyruvates. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, uh, so we start to cut up the sugar. Pyruvate isn't actually fully cut up though, so we're going to see that in the next step we have a chance of cutting it up even further. Um, but what else are we getting out of glycolysis? We're getting a few high energy electrons and we're getting just a few ATP. So um, if we're ready to move on and if oxygen is available, then we can take that pyruvate and further cut it up in the citric acid cycle. So let's um, uh, talk about that step now. Now the citric acid cycle in eukaryotes is going to take place in the mitochondria. Um, so it might just be um, uh, good to review a little bit about how the mitochondria is structured. Um, this will be important for the chemiosmosis and electron transport chain steps um, eventually as well. Um, recall from our last unit that the mitochondria actually has two membranes. Um, an, inner me uh, an outer membrane and an inner membrane that are completely separate from each other. And if membranes create a different outer environment um, from the inner environment, then if you have two membranes in this organelle, then you actually have three separate environments. You have the innermost space, which is referred to as the mitochondrial matrix. That's this blue area inside. Um, you have this sort of in-between space, which has a nice name for that. It's just called the intermembrane space, um, in between the inner and outer membranes. And then you sort of just have the cytoplasm then outside. So what I want you to imagine is that if glycolysis is taking place and some pyruvates are generated, we're going to see that the citric acid cycle takes place inside the mitochondrial matrix. So the pyruvate sugars are going to be able to pass through both membranes um, through transport proteins. So here's just a summary of that. Um, in eukaryotes, the uh, citric acid cycle is taking place inside the mitochondrial matrix. Um, prokaryotes can do respiration too, and they have all of the enzymes that the eukaryotes have for this process. They just don't have mitochondria organelles or any membrane bound organelle, right? Um, so they just have these organelles, uh, they just have these enzymes, excuse me, um, inside the cytoplasm. So what happens in the citric acid cycle? Um, this, uh, this diagram looks a little bit overwhelming too, but again, no details, no memorizing steps, no memorizing enzymes. Um, what happens? Broadly, the pyruvate comes in from glycolysis and it is immediately um, transformed into something else. I'm, I'm not going to make you memorize the name acetyl-CoA. Um, but um, some um, high energy electrons are immediately grabbed from that conversion. So we're producing some high energy electrons. And actually some CO2 is leaving as well. What we're going to see is that once it's uh, transformed into this, it can actually combine with some sugars that are just free floating in the mitochondria from previous runs of the citric acid cycle. Because if we constantly have fresh pyruvates coming in, then they can be combined with these old sugars to make new sugars um, that are bigger. And then the point of making that is that we can then cut them up again and make a lot of energy. Um, energy in the form of NADH once again, NADH once again, NADH once again over here. Um, you can see that a little bit of energy in the form of ATP is generated up here. Um, this little diagram shows GTP, but for our purposes that's basically ATP. So we're generating a little bit of energy that way too. And then in a lot of processes along the way here, um, carbon dioxide is generated. 
Um, and I point that out because really what's happening in the citric acid cycle is that the sugar is getting um, uh, cut up some more, um, pyruvate is coming in, and really um, that sugar is sort of exiting as CO2. Um, some of the sugar remains and can be recombined so that we can keep cutting it up. Um, but this is where all of the CO2 in that summary formula is coming from. Um, the CO2 is generated by finishing cutting up the sugar. Okay, So we're um, done with the sugar at this point, and what are we getting out of doing this? Again, we're getting a little bit of ATP, but not very much, but we are getting lots of high energy electrons to feed to the electron transport chain. So um, we've discussed kind of the first steps. Once again, we've discussed glycolysis, and we've discussed the citric acid cycle, and we see that both of them really involve cutting up the sugar. Um, glycolysis gets us started, and the citric acid cycle finishes the job. And so the sugar's role is done in respiration. And again, um, really what it does is it turns into CO2 um, and leaves the cell. Um, what do we get out of doing the citric acid cycle and glycolysis? We cut up the sugar and we, again, we generated a little bit of ATP, but not very much. Um, most of the energy we generated in these early steps um, is the energy of high energy electrons. So we're going to see in part two of the video how can these high energy electrons generate most of the ATP in respiration. Um, that's the final steps, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis.